for and if you're new to joining us um thanks very much just to give you a quick view of what the church's conservation trust is so we're a national charity that was set up in 1969 uh, as a genuine partnership between church and state to try and save those very historic church buildings in this country which no longer had a viable congregation to support them uh, since 1969 we've collected 356 of those churches and we collect about two or three more every single year um, we think that the impact of COVID-19 might mean that there are more of these buildings at risk because the vast majority of historic churches in this country sit in the countryside where there's the smallest and most elderly population so we're very much here to protect those buildings and make sure that communities can use and love them well into the future the impact on us of COVID was that the saddest thing was we had to close the doors of our churches. We pride ourselves on having them open and that people can go in and visit them wherever they are in the country. And so it was quite a quite a but a tear to eye really to close the doors and so we spent the rest of the time then trying to get them open again and that was quite a difficult thing because we had to undertake lots of health and safety checks etc etc we weren't allowed to undertake any events as well which is a key part of our fundraising strategy so as George said we think there's about a five hundred thousand pound gap in our income this year and we've been having to find that save money and to use our reserves as well which are mostly aimed at trying to repair historic church buildings so any support you can give us is is really gratefully received um, george has given you the opportunities to donate but join us do join in you can subscribe to our free newsletter you can bump become a member and support our work right across the country as we help protect these buildings for generations to come um, at the moment we've got these buildings open again so do check out our website i think today we've got about 270 of our 356 sites open so one of the great things you can go and do is visit them there's nothing like a good socially distanced visit and these are the buildings to do that in um, there are instructions about how to visit and when you get there there'll be some other guidance about how you get in there but we're really keen to make sure as many people as possible get into these buildings because we can't be traveling much further anywhere else so these are the great place to do it this weekend as well sees uh, Heritage Open Days, uh, a national initiative right across the country. And we've got about 190 events going on in our churches, which is just some of them are virtual uh, visits, but they're all COVID safe. Um, please do check out Heritage Open Day websites to see what's going on. But just to give you a warning, tomorrow night, if you're not going out, stay in with us. We've got Jules Holland um, introducing a gig, a virtual concert online, uh, which is all recorded in our churches, I'm very pleased to say. So uh, not only do you get to look at fantastic historic churches, but you also get to listen to some very, very good music. And I think among the headline acts are Fairport Convention and Jules Holland himself. So please do join that as well. And you can see the details on, on Facebook. Now, today I'm really, really, really pleased to have um, Professor William White with us because during lockdown, before I even knew, I bought his book you can see that here uh, and it is one of the things that I have been reading and so I was delighted when I realized that he was also the chair of the Oxford Preservation Trust because one of our former trustees is in fact uh, um, uh, the director of the Oxford Preservation Trust so we made a connection and I had a fantastic conversation asking him this huge favor if he'd come and lecture for us so I'm very pleased William that you've agreed to do so um, so William is the professor of social and architectural history at the University of Oxford He's a fellow of St John's College, the Royal Historical Society, the Society of Antiquaries, and as I said, the chair of the Oxford Preservation Trust and the Oxford Historical Society. And of course, he's published his most recent book is this Unlocking the Church, which I've really enjoyed because I thought I knew quite a lot about churches and uh, certainly Victorian ones. And he proved me entirely wrong. Uh, so it's a, a very good thing to be able to learn a, a lot more. So without further ado, let me hand you over to William. Thank you for being with us today. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. As, as I always encourage my children to say, thank you for having me. So um, it's, it's really nice to be here and hopefully I will be able to share this image, which I um, put up off, off the front cover of my book, not, not in an attempt to persuade you to buy it, because in a sense, after you've heard this, you don't need to, but mainly because um, I am contractually obliged to have that. Indeed, if my publishers had their way, I'd be wearing a t-shirt with the front cover on it, um, even as we speak. It also gives me a chance to just say a little bit about how I came to write it, because it, um, it was a, a, a book that arose out of 
two parts of my life coming together. The first, the, the, the academic, um, and the fact that I am interested in architecture as professor of architectural history, and was invited to give uh, the most strange set of lectures um, I've ever been asked to give, the Herbert Hensley Henson Lectures in the University of Oxford, which was set up from the will of the Bishop of Durham, Herbert Hensley Henson, who was a man um, who published a three-volume autobiography entitled Memoirs of an Unimportant Life, and who left money to the University of Oxford to set up lectures, and you get this in the letter when you're asked to do it, on the appeal to history as a fundamental part of Christian apologetic. And I had no idea what to do, but I was saved by the fact that the lectures that strange and daunting phrase, the appeal to history as a fundamental part of Christian apologetic, are followed by a little phrase in brackets, this may be interpreted broadly, and the book is uh, a broad interpretation of that. But those lectures also enabled me to bring together the other part of my life, because I, I'm, I'm an academic, but I'm also an Anglican priest, and um, when I'm not here in St John's or at home with my family, I served for, for 10 years as the curate in this place, in Kidlington. And this is St Mary's Church in Kidlington, um, which is a beautiful place, a wonderful medieval structure, as you can see, and a, a place that gets into Simon Jenkins' Thousand Best Churches, a place that's little visited and deserves more attention than it gets. And I spent 10 years there. And in those 10 years, I became more and more interested in how we had ended up with the church as we see it now. Because it became clear to me that the church I was looking at, although we said it was medieval, was in fact every bit as much a product of the 19th century as anything that had gone on before. And indeed everything we see here is the outcome of decisions that were made in the 19th century. And so in Unlocking the Church, what I seek to do is to explore the big question of the role of history in Christian life, but also the very local question to me of how I ended up preaching in this place. Because if we look at St Mary's Kidlington, what we see is what we've come to expect in a parish church. We've come to expect a rather lovely medieval or, or neo-medieval outside, and then inside we've come to expect perhaps not these blue plastic seats, but certainly this eastward focus towards probably a nave altar, probably with a pulpit next to it, and then a view on to the chancel to the end point, this eastward facing direction. And we've come to expect a certain experience of being in that church and a certain orientation when we're in that church. But that is an experience, an orientation that is entirely the product of Victorian interventions. This is St Mary's Kidlington today. If we'd gone there in the 18th century, by contrast, we'd have seen something very different outside not very much different at all, indeed very, very similar indeed. Inside, however, the orientation of the church and the way the church was used and experienced was completely different from our own experience. If we look here, instead of having a nave altar, instead of having a diminutive pulpit within this space, instead of facing east and towards the great east window of the church with its altar underneath, Everything within the main body of the church, within the nave, actually faced north. It faced north to this triple-decker pulpit set in the middle of the uh, northern wall. The seats, the box pews and the galleries were all directed towards this, and indeed most of the rest of the church was little used. It was used occasionally for communion services, perhaps twice a year. It was used as a school, it was used as a place to store the village fire engine. It was used as a lumber room and a place where all sorts of things could be kept. It was used for vestry meetings and other public events. But the church, the actual weekly business of going to church was focused on this and it was focused on preaching from a northern pulpit. This was undone in the 1840s and the modern 19th century, 21st century arrangement of St Mary's Kidlington 
was introduced. And the more I looked, the more I could see that far from being unusual, what this was, what this represented, was in fact a process of restoration, of refurbishing and reordering that was near universal in the middle uh, of the 19th century. The fact is that in the 19th century, almost all churches in England and many churches in Wales, Scotland and Ireland were similarly reordered as what had happened to them in the 17th and 18th centuries was undone and a new dispensation was created. By 1900, almost all churches had been restored. And of course, for the Victorians, restoration sometimes meant complete rebuilding. And as we know, the 19th century didn't just see this tremendous effort of restoration, it also saw a huge effort of church building. Indeed, the 19th century is the single greatest period of church building in this country's history. Let's have a look at just some of the statistics that are produced there. Each decade of the early 19th century, as you can see, thousands of new churches were built. By the 1840s, in the 1840s, five and a half thousand new churches were built, and that was just the beginning of a process of church building across the 19th century. By the 1850s, a new Anglican church was being consecrated every four or five days, and the number of uh, Roman Catholic and non-conformist churches increased at an even greater rate. And as we see at Kidlington, and as we'd see in many, indeed almost all of the churches built in this period, it wasn't just that new buildings were going up. It wasn't just that old buildings were being restored and effectively rebuilt. It was also that the way in which they were being restored, the way in which they were being built was changed utterly. Nice example can be found just five minutes from each other in central London. Here is All Souls Langham Place, built by Nash in the 1820s. It's a classical building, and it's a building, as you can see, that is set up to maximise the acoustic effects, to maximise the chances of people being able to hear. Here, just five minutes down the road, is All Saints Margaret Street by William Butterfield, built in the 1850s. It is a Gothic building, and what a Gothic building. If you go inside, this is a place designed to maximise listening. This is a place designed over all to overwhelm you with its visual impact. Or, if we put it in a more Church's Conservation Trust way, what I wanted to ask in this book, and what I hope I've done, is how do we get from this church, St John the Evangelist in Chichester, which is a plain, brick-built, classical preaching box, to something like this, which is All Saints Jesus Lane in Cambridge, which is a classical, which is a, 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 a obviously not classical, which is a neo-Gothic fantasy covered in these extraordinary images and patterns and a recreation, indeed, a reimagining of the Middle Ages. So what I wanted to do in the book and what I want to do in this short talk is to address the question of how that happened. Not just what happened, but also why it happened. Why were so many churches built and why were they built so differently from how churches had been built in the century before? And to do that, I want to ask three questions or, or try and address it in three different ways. To think about history and the role of history in all this. Why is it that they turn to the Middle Ages so often as they seek to build new churches? I want to think too about questions of meaning. What are they trying to convey? What ideas are they presenting when they cover their churches in ornamentation, when they cover the walls in marble, in paintings, in encaustic tiles, when they fill windows which had been filled with plain glass for a century or more, with stained glass and painted glass and other forms of ornamentation. And finally, I want to think a little bit about what they thought they were doing in terms of people's emotional responses to all this. I think there is an intellectual argument about history. I think there is something here too about communication, but I think there's also something about how the church builders wanted to make people feel 
And that, I think, is as important as anything, because I think that's something that we have inherited and something we continue to expect. We continue to expect that as we enter a church, we will feel something. It will feel different from the world outside. It will feel different from our homes. That, I think, is an invention of the 19th century, and it may be the most important invention of them all. So let's start with questions of history, because it is a puzzle. It's a paradox that the 19th century, the century that brings us the Industrial Revolution, the century in which Britain is the most developed economically and industrially, in a century in which Britain is producing iron and steel and plate glass, is also a century in which the churches that are being built, and indeed many other buildings that are being built, are built in styles derived from the Middle Ages, a period that had been seen for centuries as absolutely the most backward, absolutely the nadir of architecture. One of the answers to that question comes in the work of the extraordinary architectural uh, writer, polemicist and architect Augustus Pugin, the architect amongst other things, who produces those extraordinary Gothic treatment of the Palace of Westminster. This is from his book, Contrasts. And what Contrast does, well, is exactly what it says on the tin. What it does is to contrast modern buildings with medieval ones. And what he does is he seeks to show how much better the medieval world was than the modern world. If the modern world he presents is um, essentially pagan, utterly materialistic, and wholly unchristian, the medieval world is presented as pious, as essentially Christian, and as authentically beautiful. And here you have contrasted royal chapels. This is the Chapel Royal in Brighton, which, as you can see, is a preaching box, but more than a preaching box. He presents it as being little more than an opera house. Here is St George's Chapel in Windsor she spells in the medieval way, which, as you can see, is not about the people, but about the worship of God. Well, Pugin does this again and again, and he's extremely persuasive, or at least he was at the time, in what he attempts to show is, and here we see it, that the modern world here, the 19th century, and there indeed is a church by Nash, is simply not as good as the medieval world. If we look at this, this is the closing picture. Here is Veritas, the eye of truth. Here is the Libra Excellentiae, the scales of excellence. And we can see in the quote from Daniel, they are weighed in the balance and found wanting. And a good example in a way in which we can understand how he was convincing people and he was deeply convincing. George Gilbert Scott, the great church architect, said that reading Pugin was like a conversion, an evangelical conversion experience, which utterly transformed his understanding of architecture. Here we can see Pugin's contrasted residences for the poor, which make the arguments absolutely plain and simple. And of course, this is written just after the introduction of the new poor laws, which consigned so many of the poor to workhouses. Here is a modern poor house. It's essentially a Benthamite panopticon. It's a, it's, a, it's a building designed to control and to intimidate. It's a building in Pugin's account that actually, as you can see, is wholly unproductive. And indeed, everything around it dies. We also know it's a bad building because it's a classical building. And Pugin is absolutely clear that classical architecture isn't just ugly, it's also evil. So here is the poor man in his cell. Here is the master with his whips and chains. Here is the diet of the poor man, which you won't be able to read, but essentially says gruel, water, gruel, water, gruel, gruel, water, water. When the poor man dies, he's taken away for dissection. And if he's bad, he is separated from his family and locked back in his cell. Here is the modern world, a world of ugly architecture and a world of architecture that is positively evil. Here, by contrast, is the ancient poor house, which is modelled after the Hospital of St Cross in Winchester. Here is a beautiful building. Here is a Christian building. Look at the size of the chapel. Here is a productive building. You can see, look, there are orchards, there are gardens. It's part of the community. Here's the poor man in his robes of state. 
Here's the master doling out food. Here's the diet, beef, beer, mutton, beef, beer, mutton, beef, beer, mutton. I mean, actually far worse for you than the gruel, but they weren't to know that. And when you die, presumably of a heart attack, you are given a full requiem mass. And if you're bad in this building, and who could be bad in this building, but if you are bad in this building, then they read the Bible to you until you stop it. Pugin's account was hugely convincing to people who were frightened by the developments of the modern world. It was hugely convincing to people who were frightened by the rise of modern capitalism, to people who were alarmed by the development of democratic ideas, to people who wanted to recreate a stable, organic, Christian community instead of a frightening capitalist, materialist society. And at the heart of this all was, of course, the idea that it was the church who would solve it. Here is Pugin's vision of the England that could be, an England which you see is entirely made up of churches that he has designed. Well, that was one account of the reason why the Gothic Revival was developed. It was developed because they drew upon history in order to find a way to build in the modern world. But there's more to it than that. It wasn't just the idea that they could find hope in the past that drove the sense that the, um, that the Gothic revival was appropriate and that the old classical dispensation of the church building was inappropriate, not least because it seemed unchristian. There was also a sense, a very strong sense amongst Pugin and his followers and other people who were not necessarily linked to Pugin, that what was also needed was a set of churches which were going to convey Christian truths to people. Indeed, one of the biggest changes, and it's a neglected change, it seems to me, one of the biggest changes of the uh, 19th century was precisely the way in which people didn't just start, as Pugin did, to conflate ethics and aesthetics, to think that beautiful things were also good things. The other change here that I want to talk about is the way in which they started to conflate or confuse buildings and books, to think of buildings as being like texts, as being capable of conveying meaning. And we find another example of that in the 1830s, in this little church just down the road from me in the Oxfordshire, in the Oxford suburb of Littlemore. This is St Mary and St Nicholas Littlemore, which was built for the then young, then Anglican, uh, then Oxford academic, John Henry Newman, later of course to convert famously, notoriously to Roman Catholicism and to end his life as a cardinal. He's now a saint. Well, Newman was determined to build this little church for the small community of Littlemore. And when it was opened in 1836, he delivered a sermon, a sermon that must have gone on more than an hour, to that little community, explaining why he built this church and explaining what this church was for. And what he said, almost at the beginning of that sermon, and went on to elaborate throughout the rest of it, was really very significant. And the first time anyone had done this for centuries, what he said was, I want you to look on this building less as a building than as a text, a sacred text full of um, uh, powerful messages about Christian ideas and theology. And he said, once I finished this sermon, you will be able to look on this church and read its meanings. And once you've read those meanings, you will understand the Christian faith that it's here to stand for. And so what he said was, take a look at this church. What you'll notice is that there is only one door. That door symbolizes Christ, who is the only way to salvation. As you come in through the door, here it is, you will see a cross over the altar. That cross symbolizes the way to salvation, which is through the atonement, through the crucifixion. He says, thus, at the moment you stand at the threshold of this church, you see the two fundamental truths of Christian faith. 
on the one hand, the incarnation, the embodiment of God in Christ. On the other hand, you see the crucifixion, the atonement, Christ's saving death for the whole of humanity. And he goes on. He says, if you look at the East End, you will see there are three windows. Those three windows symbolize the Trinity. If you look underneath them, there are seven arches. Those seven arches, he doesn't say, almost certainly symbolize the seven sacraments, but he does say that they symbolize the 164th verse of the 119th Psalm. Obviously, don't need to tell you, but seven times a day I will praise thee. And so what he does is to go through the whole of the church, which you'll notice is facing eastward, facing the altar. What he does is to say, this is a Christian text. It's the first time anyone has made that claim for centuries. I spent months reading consecration sermons of churches from the middle of the 18th century to the middle of the 19th century, just so you don't have to. And what I found was that nobody made this argument until Newman did. And then as soon as Newman did it, other people started to say something similar. And indeed, the ideas get broadcast more widely. Ten years later, after Newman had left the Church of England, and indeed ten years after his church in Littlemore had been consecrated, his former friend and ally in the Oxford movement, the great Tractarian John Keeble, built his own church at Hursley in Hampshire, and here it is. And when it was opened, Keeble gave a similar account of it. He pointed to the three aisles and said these three aisles symbolise the Trinity. He pointed to the stained glass windows, which he said would provide a course in the whole of sacred history. He pointed to each of the carvings. Each one was designed to tell its own particular story and to symbolise something particular. Throughout the church, in fact, the encaustic tiles, the stained glass, the design of the building, all of this, Keeble said, was designed to convey spiritual truths. Even the pews were designed to do that, because what the pews did was to organise people, to force them to their knees, to force them to face east, and to separate men and women. Keeble designed the pews himself so that, um, so that there was a, uh, a little rail underneath the men's side where they could put their hats and umbrellas. Keeble and Newman, of course, were both members of the Tractarian movement, the Oxford movement. They were both high church people attempting to recreate something like the medieval Catholic church within the Church of England. But the idea soon spread well beyond that. We come here to St Paul's Brighton. What we see is a church built as an outspring of an offspring, as part of that Anglo-Catholic moment. But when it was consecrated, those who came to speak at it were not all members of the Oxford movement, and yet all of them made the same argument about this great new statement of medieval architecture and of uh, communication set down in Brighton. These are the two archdeacons of Chichester. Henry Manning, who, as you see, goes on to become a Roman Catholic and is, at the point that uh, St Paul's Brighton is consecrated, very much part of the Oxford movement. He goes in and makes a speech, or rather gives a sermon, very like the one that Keeble and Newman had given at the opening of their churches. He talks about the symbolism, he talks about the messages, he talks about this as less a building than a book. More surprising, however, is the other Archdeacon of Chichester, Julius Hare, who is a convinced liberal, who is a, a broad churchman, who had no time for the Oxford movement, but who nonetheless arrives and makes exactly the same points. What seems to happen is that influenced not just by theology, but also by various other modes of thought, romanticism generally, Coleridge's writings uh, more particularly, and just by a generalised sense that once this idea of buildings communicating has got out, everyone starts to participate in it. It starts to move not just through the Church of England, shaping their new buildings, but also to nonconformist churches and Catholic churches too. Here is Leeds Parish Church, now Leeds Minster, which was begun 
about the same time, and which is very obviously and indeed very deliberately uh, uh, an attempt to produce a building that speaks. Here, more interestingly, just half a mile away, is Mill Hill Unitarian Chapel, where exactly the same thing happens. Indeed, they build it in the same style, to the same plan, and with many of the same motivations as Leeds Parish Church. What we see, in other words, is the idea of communication, the idea of the building as a book, soon becomes widespread, well beyond the Oxford movement, well beyond the Church of England, and it even starts to influence churches and chapels that look nothing like the buildings I've just been showing you. This is the Metropolitan Tabernacle of the Elephant and Castle, which was built for the single greatest preacher and the most influential Baptist of the 19th century, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Now Spurgeon finds the ideas of the Oxford movement, indeed of the Church of England, utterly, utterly appalling. He sees them as idolatrous. He sees them as essentially unchristian. But he seizes upon the idea of buildings that speak, of buildings that communicate. When he's asked, what should a Baptist chapel look like? Spurgeon says, well, there are two biblical languages. There is Hebrew, the Hebrew of the Old Testament, and there is Greek, the Greek of the New. Baptist buildings, Spurgeon says, should be Greek because they will then speak the same language as the New Testament. And so the Metropolitan Tabernacle, which looks utterly unlike any of the other buildings I've been showing you, is nonetheless inspired by a similar sense that this is a building that speaks. It just speaks a different language. The idea that buildings communicate is entirely the same. But buildings didn't just communicate in this new dispensation. Buildings were also meant to do things to you. They were also meant to make you feel something. They were meant to be active agents, in a sense. This was a tremendous change from the 18th century dispensation, which, as I say, had been one in which you went to church to listen, not to look, and in which you went to church a church that was just a box for preaching in a church that didn't mean anything, a church that wasn't meant to do anything. In the 19th century, by contrast, we get a strong sense that these buildings are not just saying things, they are doing things too. Let's go to Leeds, for example, and let's go to Leeds Parish Church, where it's very clear that movement through this space isn't just movement through a place where you can hear things, and isn't just moving through a space where you can see things, it's also the idea that you're in a space that makes you feel things. So as you get closer and closer to the East End, so it becomes busier, so it becomes brighter, so the light is changed, so the feeling is changed. What you're in, in a way, is something designed to do things to you, a piece of technology almost. We return to All Saints Margaret Street. We can see that process amplified yet further. Very clearly the case if we look at All Saints Margaret Street, but we're looking at a building that's designed to communicate. There's not a bit of this. It doesn't have some symbolic significance. And indeed its architect, William Butterfield, talked about architecture as a work of theology as much as a work of construction. But even more interestingly, I think, is the fact that this is a building that is designed to enclose you, that's designed to take you out of the world, that's designed to have an effect on you. Butterfield does it through the design, he does it through the ornamentation, he does it through the acoustic properties, because all these churches have a much greater um, uh, reverberation, a much greater um, echo than anything that had built before, but he also does it by excluding the world from this building. As you can see, once you're in it, you can't get out. He does the same at the building just next to me, at Keeble College Chapel, where, again, 
Here you have a building which could have had great windows, which could have had great vistas and views out. And if it had been an 18th century chapel, it certainly would have done. But here we are enclosed. Indeed, the only break in the wall is something Butterfield didn't want and wasn't involved in, which is the addition of this little door that leads into the chapel where Holman Hunt's Light of the World is kept. The idea is, Pugin writes about it, Newman writes about it, and there's a whole literature of terrible, terrible Tractarian novels and Victorian verse about it. But you should enter this place and feel that you have encountered the sublime, feel really that you've encountered the divine. So what are the consequences of this? What does it mean to have buildings that draw upon history, that are intended to communicate? and which are meant to act upon those who enter them. Well, one of them, and here we see it, is this move from what we can call an acoustic church, an auditory church, a church in which everything is focused on the pulpit, in which it doesn't matter which way you sit, it doesn't matter where you're looking, and indeed the more you can look out through these plain windows as you listen, the better. From that 18th century dispensation, to this new 19th century idea of the visual church, of a church in which you look at things, a church in which you are facing east, a church in which the pulpit and preaching, although important, is not nearly as important as the effect the church has on you and the message the church itself communicates on you. And as I said, this isn't just something that happens to the high church in England. What's extraordinary, what sustains it, is the fact that those ideas become more general. Indeed, they become almost universal. This is Cheltenham Parish Church. And here, or at any rate here thereabouts, is the perpetual curate of Cheltenham, Francis Close. Now, Francis Close was an evangelical. Francis Close was a hugely important controversialist. Francis Close was so dominant a figure in Cheltenham, which became a great evangelical borough, that he was known by Tennyson as the Pope of Cheltenham. Francis Close was a man whose preaching was so valued and so loved that he was the recipient of more than a thousand pairs of monogram slippers given to him by the grateful evangelical ladies of Cheltenham. Francis Close loathed everything that the Tractarians were doing. He loathed everything that Newman was doing. He was utterly opposed to everything that Pugin was doing. The restoration of churches, he preached in a sermon entitled, The Restoration of Churches is the Restoration of Popery. And here you can see the church that he's in, in which, just like the church in Kidlington, everything is focused on the north in which galleries, in which box pews bring you closer to the preacher, in which the old medieval walls and ceilings and windows are covered up with plaster designed to improve the acoustic properties of the place. And yet here, by the 1840s, is Cheltenham Parish Church again. And what you see here is precisely the opposite. What's happened is that even in this evangelical church, the idea that the church should go back to its medieval origins, the idea that the church should focus on the visual aspects of religion, the idea that the church should feel different from other buildings has become dominant. That has an effect on all sorts of things. It changes, for example, the way in which people experience worship and the places that they sit. They move from box pews to something much more controlled. It has an effect on the experience outside the church. As people start to think about the churchyard as being an extension of the church, not just somewhere that's locked, not just somewhere where you can pasture animals, but itself as a holy space. The 19th century sees a forest, not just of these new, tombs and memorials, but also a forest of lich gates designed to signify the way in which you move from the ordinary everyday life into something sacred. And they go beyond that. 
They go beyond that with processions that carry that idea, which resacralize the space around the churches and between the churches. It's a process that's begun in places like Littlemore in the 1830s and a process that then goes on to reshape Littlemore, which after Newman's time acquires a lichgate, a school, processions, a tower and much more besides. It's a process that we can see reshaping many, not all, but almost all of the churches in the care of the church's conservation trusts. Here's All Saints Harwood, All Souls Haley Hill, St Edmund Failing, uh, All Souls in Cambridge. Here are examples of a more general trend, a trend in which churches aren't just refurbished, restored, rebuilt and built anew, but a process too in which the church comes to be understood in different ways. It comes to be understood as a vehicle of theology, and it comes to be understood as an engine of emotion. Those changes were utterly transformative in the 19th century, and they shape our experience of the church today. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, William. That was a, a phenomenally fantastic lecture, and there's been loads of really interesting comments and questions coming in already. So we're shortly about to be going into question time. So everyone, um, please do um, use that comment box and do um, put any of your questions in there, and we'll um, put those um, to Professor William now. Um, I was really struck um, when you sort of showed about some of the CCT, CCT churches, so All Saints Cambridge. Um, we've put it up, for those of you um, joining the lecture, we've posted some links to find out more about those churches in our collection, which will take you to our website. And um, you showed just at the end there, um, um, Halifax at Haley Hill, which um, was, I think it was Gilbert Scott when he said it, it was probably his it was his favourite church, it was his triumph that he fought, um, that he had built. So um, yeah, we've got some phenomenally um, important pieces of heritage in our care. Um, so we're going to questions now. Um, I think the first one to kick it off is, do you think there's a connection between new churches that were built in the Gothic revival style um, and, you know, them being located in very poor economic areas to serve poor people? Well, that is an interesting question. I mean, there are there are lots of examples of the rich building um, uh, uh, um, uh, Gothic revival churches um, too, um, but but that's a, it's a good point, and I think there are two answers to that. The first is that um, initially in the eighteen twenties, eighteen tens, and eighteen twenties, when the church commissioners start building these churches, and one of the interesting things I didn't talk about is the way in which um, the state is underwriting the cost of building some of these in the eighteen tens, twenties, and thirties, indeed into the forties. The church commissioners initially think of Gothic as being um, cheaper than classical architecture, and they think of it as being cheaper because they think it isn't really an architectural style at all. They think, well, with classical architecture, you've got to obey the rules, whereas Gothic can pretty much do what you like. So it's, um, it allows you to do, do whatever you want. Um, that changes. And that's, I think, where the point about um, why they might be choosing to build these churches in poorer areas and, and in new, new locations in this Gothic style um, uh, is so important. What they want to do is they want, and again, this is, an idea of communication. This is something Simon Bradley, the editor of the Pevsner series, has, has talked about, which is what they want to do is to communicate very clearly to people that they suspect don't know very much about the church, that this is a church. And Gothic is chosen, not least because it communicates strongly the purposes of the building that they're building. It communicates very simply. And that's allied to arguments that are made um, within the Church of England in particular, that they can emphasize the fact that the Church of England is the church, capital T, capital C. It's the church with continuity going back to the earliest Christians. And they do that in order to say that the nonconformists and the Catholics are sort of Johnny come lately's who aren't, aren't really the church. And if we think back to Leeds, the example I showed you, it's very clear that's what's happening in Leeds where the, the vicar um, hook is um, very keen to claw back 
the um, population of Leeds that he fears have all become dissenters by building something which is a, just a bigger version of the existing church, of, a, of an existing church. Um, but it's also clear that one of the reasons why the Unitarians at Mill Hill choose the same style is that they want to make the point that actually they're the church, that they're the real ones. And so there's an interesting sense in which First of all, we have Gothic because it's cheap and it's not really proper. Then we have Gothic because it communicates stuff. And then we have a fight over who really owns Gothic and what sort of Gothic you're going to have. And that links on to all sorts of other interesting questions about the way in which this is kind of competitive church building. But I can, I can come to that later if we have time. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. That was a really fascinating um, answer there. Um, and I think slightly tied into that is um, a second question that's come in, so, you know, where someone's asked perhaps the Gothic revival in church architecture was a reaction to the grimness of in the Industrial Revol Revolution, um, like in art, the pre-Raphaelites strove to return to pure medieval art. So I wonder if it's in some ways it's trying to give people a sense of hope. Yes. How these buildings are spaces where you can come, you can have a sense of feeling, that sense of hope. You know, I mean, the link to the pre-Raphaelites is, 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 is a really, really um, acute point to make there. I mean, it's absolutely clear is that it's part of a whole generation of people like the pre-Raphaelites, like, um, like Tennyson and, and a lot of the, uh, and, and a lot, a lot of poets, um, well, later on people like William Morris, um, like, um, like some politicians, I mean, you know, the Young England movement of the 1840s around Benjamin Disraeli is very closely, you know, linked to this. You just need to read his book Sybil, or or to look at his um, collaborator, Sir John, uh, Lord John Manners, whose great argument is that you can solve unemployment in the north of England by re re reinstituting monasticism, and that will that will solve it. So there's certainly a sense in which the shocks of the Industrial Revolution, the shocks of the French Revolution, the shocks of, you know, change and greater urbanization does have this effect of putting people back to find a point at which things, before which things went wrong, and you can start again. And the idea, there's, there's a kind of myth about the, the Middle Ages that's part of that. The pre-Raphaelites are really interesting too, because they also like the architects and, uh, and churchmen I'm talking about, they also have an idea that great art is art that's truthful. They also import an idea of truth into all this and of an ethics into all this. And as a result, they start to talk about art as communicating. And so there's a, there's a whole interesting thing about a sort of move which follows Coleridge, but not just Coleridge, other people writing, um, European writers like Schlegel, who are, who are talking about the way in which what we've got to do is to see beyond science and see beyond the Enlightenment and start to see the world through the symbolism of the world, start to see God's handiwork in all this. And so there's a, you know, in a way, this is, this is part of uh, an ongoing um, engagement like the pre-Raphaelites, like some of the poets I've talked about, like some of the politicians I've talked about, who are really products of, of, of romanticism. Thank you. Um, we get lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to try and blitz through a few more of these. But um, uh, this is quite an interesting one, actually, because um, I've not uh, thought about it in this way. But would you compare the acoustic style of church arrangements, arrangements to the layout of a synagogue? Oh, no, that's very interesting. Yeah, no, no. I mean, what, what's... What, what's what what's so I mean in a sense in a sense the 18th century church is is a bit more like a, a synagogue with a kind of bimmer in the middle and, and and people and people are listening to yeah I mean on the one hand the the reading of the of the Torah on the other hand the singing of the cantor so in some senses in some senses it is and I mean you can link this to a longer standing question about church design which is is this more like a synagogue or more like a temple. And, you know, that's, that's a whole theological argument that we, we, we could have there. What's interesting in the 19th century, of course, um, is as the, as the Jewish community in England um, becomes wealthier, as it seeks to become more anglicized, um, is the way in which synagogue design starts to absorb some of these, these ideas. I mean, just in the same way that rabbis start to wear dog collars, um, so you find synagogues starting to be built in not, all, not often um, pure Gothic styles, but often what's called a sort of Saracenic Gothic or a Moorish Gothic. And again, they start to, they start to look more and more like the church buildings of the period. 
Thank you. And um, we're, go we're jumping into Pugin here because we've had a couple of questions into Pugin. So why do you think Pugin chose to use sort of the medieval style um, of Gothic architecture and instead of creating his own brand new style, do you think? That is a good question. I think there's a general answer to that, which is that there is a, a, a great deal of suspicion amongst architects as a whole of the idea that a new style is possible. I think there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strong sense that the alternative to using older styles is something that isn't architecture at all, um, which is just engineering. And that's, that's a battle that goes on throughout the 19th and into the 20th centuries. Pugin's particular fondness of the Middle Ages is very strongly linked to his fondness for the, I mean, his, his conversion to the Roman Catholic Church. It's very clear that he has a sense that Englishness and Christianity are bound up in the Middle Ages. And he comes to believe that the Gothic is, as a result, and he always calls it this, is, is, is the Christian style. And he comes to think of Gothic as being, um, you know, not just, a, not just an architecture, but a kind of ethic. So when he marries his third wife, both his previous wives died, he says, at last, I have got myself a good Gothic woman. And that's the sort of highest praise he can possibly bestow on her, which is that she's not just beautiful, but she's also moral and she's also Catholic. Thank you. I think that's quite an interesting um, description to describe your your wife is a, a, a gothic, real gothic. My woman. wife wouldn't appreciate it, but you know. <laughs> um, do you think, uh, we've had lots of questions coming, so um, was not the rise of English Palladianism um, in its reaction against the excesses of the Baroque concerned with many of the same pangs of the Gothic revival over a century later? If so, why then did the latter see so much more success in capturing the nation's attention? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, it's certainly the case. I mean, I think that's absolutely right, is that there is a, there is a, a strong sense that Palladian architecture is seen, and I mean, this is something Tim Mole has written about, is seen as being English and manly and Protestant because it's simple and it's rule-bound, but it's also free in some ways. Um, why, didn't it, why didn't it capture the um, nation's attention? Well, I mean, in truth, it did. And in truth, um, there is a huge amount of, of, of Palladian church building and still more of, of, of Palladian um, of church restoration and refurbishment in the 18th century, which is turning them into um, Palladian or, or at least more classical buildings. What happens, and this is the really interesting thing, is that all of that is, is, is both unpicked by the Victorians, in which they rip out all this stuff. So I talked about what was happening in Kidlington and what happened in, in Cheltenham. I mean, those experiences of just going in and ripping out everything the 18th century had done was, was fairly universal. Um, that's important. What, what is interesting is the fact that the Victorian church dispensation didn't go away, is that, that the, the notion that the church should look like this, the notion that the church should, um, should, should feel like this, um, has not gone away. Um, and I mean, what's, what's striking is that we're going through a period which looks like an undoing of that. We're going through a period in which a lot of churches are having pews removed, a lot of churches are having kitchens installed, a lot of churches are being domesticated in ways that go back in some ways to the 18th century church dispensation. What's interesting about that is the way in which those interventions are defended in terms that would be entirely recognisable to the Victorians but would have made no sense at all to the 18th century. It's defended as communicating something, it's commended, com it's commended as making you feel in some way. So the, the, the Victorians, um, you know, on, well it depends on your perspective, either have a lot to answer for all the Victorians uh, have bequeathed us a particular understanding, which makes going back to the 18th century dispensation quite hard for us to do imaginatively. Thank you. I think that's a really interesting um, point to mention there about, you know, how, you know, uh, and certainly as a conservation charity, um, you know, rolling back um, so many years and sort of the, there are certain questions that are posed um, with conservation ethics in mind when we want to um, do work like that. 
Um, we've got time, I think, for maybe a, one more question. Um, and I think this is quite an interesting one to finish on. Um, someone's asked for your opinion um, on the local or regional factors in the development of the ideas you've mentioned in your talk today. Um, for example, the influence of the Keebles in the Cotswolds, or Bishop Hamilton in Sarum, or the Dyson architects like GE Street in Oxford. No, that's a really, really good point. I mean, what this is about, and, and, and what I try to do in the book is to get away from sort of big things like romanticism and sort of general movements like that, and to think very precisely uh, about pre exactly that, exactly the way in which particular individuals are starting to do this and particular individuals are making decisions. There's a very useful book by George Herring yeah. on Tractarianism in the parishes, which traces these connections, which shows how people's experiences in particular locations carry them out into other places. But, but the examples we've just heard are important too, because there are in each diocese, um, there are diocesan building societies who are desperate to learn how to build churches. Each diocese has its own surveyor or architect, and GE Street is a really good example of that, who is, who's, who's learning from this, who's part of this, and who tends to present a, a solution to it. In, in, in the Diocese of Oxford in particular, where Street is based, um, it's also true to say that the bishop, Samuel Wilberforce, is, is going through and, and refusing permission for churches that don't conform to this model that we're talking about. So what you're getting Getting is absolutely you're getting these general trends but what's most interesting to me is the way in which those trends are being used by individuals and by groups of people in their particular localities to achieve similar effects really? so it's a really good question and you know one can look diocese to diocese parish to parish the way in which individuals are making these decisions which also helps explain why some churches escape this there are, there are a few churches that just don't. And, and if you look, it's because either the parish is too poor or because there's somebody who sets his or her face against this. And as a result, it doesn't happen. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions. Thank you, everyone, for those really interesting questions. Oh, they were brilliant. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry we haven't had time to answer all of them, but do keep them coming in and we'll do our best to get um, written responses to those questions. So do keep commenting away. Um, thank you so much, Professor White, for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you giving um, up your time um, to do this talk. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us, as I said, today. Um, next week's lecture, unfortunately, we've had to cancel due to unforeseen circumstances. However, we are hoping to put that on at a later date. Um, so do keep um, your eyes um, peeled on our Facebook page um, for an announcement for when we'll be bringing um, our talk on the stained glass at St Mary the Virgin Shrewsbury. So our next lecture will be taking place on Thursday the 24th of September and that will be looking at picking up the pieces, the dissolution of the monasteries and its aftermath. And this lecture has been given by Dr Hugh Wilmot who is a senior lecturer in archaeology at the University of Sheffield. So do join us for that. Um, as we said at the start, if you enjoy these free lectures, please do consider supporting our vital work in caring for historic churches throughout England. As I said, you can donate three pounds by texting seven zero double sorry by texting CCT to seven zero double three one to give gift three pounds. You can make a donation on our website, or you can take advantage of our special membership offer. Um, there are details in the bio. Along with details in the bio, there's also ways that you can buy um, Professor White's book that he's shown and then the lecture, so please do have a look at that. But if you've got any questions um, or any ideas for lecture topics, please do um, send us a direct message. And if this is your first time attending one of the lectures, do comment below as we'd love to say hello and um, get your feedback. But thank you so much for joining us, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you shortly. Thank you.